This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, once again, here in Lecture 12.4, we find ourselves dealing with issues and technical matters that have not changed over the last couple of years. And for that reason, we're able to utilise yet again recordings that were made in both Finance Act 2019 and Finance Act 20 based lectures. The only difference that we're used to seeing, and is mentioned here in the note in front of you on the screen, is that in the part of this lecture that is from FA 2019, where we deal with an example that involves capital losses, netting out gains and losses, establishing when what would be taxable or what the net loss would be available to uh, utilise in the future via a carry forward. But that example uses an AEA, our annual exempt amount, of course, there of £12,000, such as it was based on FA19. Now, we know that since FA20 and including now also in FA21, relevant for our exams, based on Finance Act 2021, the AEA is 12300 So apart from that class example done on screen, where I use an AEA of 12000 that would now be 12300 but everything else is exactly the same. So again, the recordings you're about to see, a combination of both FA 2019 with that issue about AEA, then FA 2020, where there is no issue, even though uh, I think it's example seven that I cover there, because the AEA for last year was exactly the same as this year at £12,300. OK, over to you. Enjoy. Well, to start this session off, therefore, one or two new things, but mostly revision in terms of the capital gains tax computations that we've seen so far. You will recall, at least I hope you will, that we said that for a capital gain to arise, there had to be three basic ingredients. A chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. And when we looked at that chargeable disposal, we said it wouldn't always be simply by means of a sale. What is a frequently tested area that we'll see more of in chapter 14 is where an individual gives away either an outright gift or a sale at undervalue. It's worth 30,000, but sells it to his or her son or daughter for only 10,000, a sale at undervalue. But what we might see is some element of gift involved. And if that happens, if there is a donative intent here on the part of the donor to the donee, whether gifting outright or gifting in part to a sale at undervalue, then we compute the gain based on the open market value of that asset. And that was the first issue that we had to deal with here when hopefully before this session, you had a quick read through as I asked you to at the end of the last session there, on these particular points. Firstly, disposal proceeds. We want the actual consideration when the disposal is made at arm's length. But market value would be used in other cases. For example, when the disposal is a gift, the most usual situation. Remember that a chargeable disposal includes a gift and therefore open market value should be used in computing that gain. And that applies whether the gift is an outright gift or whether it is a sale at undervalue. I sell to my son uh, an asset worth £30,000 for £10,000. Whether I've actually got proceeds of £10,000 or not at all, the open market value of that asset is £30,000. And the gain, therefore, is based on that value. Now, in the circumstances we see, it is usual and probably will be the case that the market value will, of course, be provided to you. That's not that you can work out for yourself. But there is just one little rule, valuation rule, that we need to know here. It has to do with quoted shares. Now, we're talking a lot about shares in our next chapter together, chapter 13 there. And we will see both quoted and unquoted shares. But when quoted shares are gifted, the value may not be given in the exam and should be calculated as the mid price based on the day's quoted prices given in the question. There will be two prices, a bid and offer price. It doesn't matter what they are, but there will be two prices that may be provided to you. As here, 
Jenny gifted 1,000 shares in MPLC when they were quoted at £4, stroke £4.08. We've got those two prices, which do we use? Well, we don't use either of them. It is the mid price, a simple average, therefore, the mid price. What will that mid price be? What is midway between £4 and £4.08? And Very obviously, £4.04. And so 1,000 shares would be valued at £4.04p. And, and that would go into any capital gains calculation that was required on that particular disposal. So a simple exercise there. We value at the mid price, midway between the two prices quoted. Moving on to having got any market value to use in substitution for any actual sale proceeds, there may still be selling expenses that are incurred. The typical ones we see that are allowable deductions from the sales proceeds to give you the net proceeds. Legal fees, of course, for example, you're disposing of a property, whether it's commercial or residential, a property sale is likely to require uh, legal assistance there, and that assistance doesn't come cheap, and therefore there will be legal fees. To sell anything, you may have to advertise it, so advertising fees. You might put it through an auction, and therefore there are auctioneer's fees. If we go back to the idea of selling a property, there'll be an estate agent there, as we may call them, but there would be agency fees, brokers fees, anyone who carries out that process on behalf to assist us in selling a property. All of those are perfectly allowable selling expenses and will therefore be deducted from your proceeds to your disposal consideration to come up with your net proceeds there. Costs. Obviously, when we first buy an asset, the cost of uh, acquisition and if we were buying a property, we too would incur legal expenses. So there'd be any incidental costs of acquisition. If an asset was acquired as a result of a gift to the taxpayer, again, we haven't always bought it at full value. It may have been gifted in full or in part to us. Then if that was a result of a gift, it would be deemed acquired at its then market value. Now, often, of course, when an asset is acquired by means of a gift was sadly on the death of the taxpayer who had previously owned that asset, in which case you will be given a market value. Uh, well, if you remember the term that we uh, use there and that you must recognise in the exam, a probate value. That's what its open market value was at the date of the death of the taxpayer the probate value, and that asset will pass to that beneficiary at its then probate, the market value at the date of death. That will become the allowable cost to that beneficiary should they in the future ever dispose of that asset. Having dealt with our original acquisition, it's possible with certain assets like properties, probably the most likely, that we may incur expenditure on enhancing the value of the asset. Improvement expenditure. Now that is capital expenditure, not revenue expenditure. There is a difference here between simply repairing a property, painting and decorating of that property, for example, which is normal repairs and maintenance, that's a revenue expense, and actually improvement expenditure, where we're adding something to the property. We're building an extension. We're adding on a conservatory there. We're building a garage. So there's a difference between revenue expense that is merely repairs and maintenance and capital expenditure that represents an enhancement in terms of the capital value of that particular asset. Losses. Right, the very beginning we saw, the very beginning of uh, this chapter, we saw how it was that if we incurred losses, how we would get relief for those losses. And we had to divide the use of losses between those losses sustained on disposals made in this, the current tax year, 
as compared to, kept separate to those losses, any losses brought forward from previous tax years at the start of this tax year. So what do we do with them? This again should be revision. Where capital losses arise, they are set against capital gains in the same tax year. So here, this is a rule. There is no election or claims that can be made. If you crystallise both gains and losses in the same tax year, they will be netted out. First thing you do, get the net gains and losses of the tax year. The current year losses set off is made to the maximum possible extent. It cannot be restricted to, for example, avoid wasting your AEA. You can't do that. So what we might have, for example, is a situation where, and we'll put these numbers down in a written example in a moment's time, someone has made a gain in the tax year of £10,000 and has sustained a loss of £8,000. Now, what we can see there is that that loss would have no tax value in this tax year. If we had not sustained that loss, there would simply be a gain of £10,000. A gain of 10 is less than the AEA of 12000 And on that basis, therefore, there would be no CGT liability. We'd have gain 10, AEA, that would be 10,000 of the 12,000 used and no taxable gains, no CGT liability. All we've done by crystallising the loss in the same tax year as the gain, gain 10,000, loss 8,000, is to bring the net gains of the year down from 10,000 to 2,000 pounds there. An even lower figure, but whether it was 10, whether it was 2, those net gains would be covered in full by the AEA. So we have wasted the benefit of the use of that loss. That's therefore where planning comes in as regards the timing of our disposals. You, the taxpayer, here have far more control over the amount of CGT liability that you pay and when you pay it than you do with income. In terms of income, you have a certain amount of income each tax year, be that employment income or trading income, property income, dividend income, savings income, some interest income there. And you don't control those figures. You don't control your salary. You go some way to controlling your trading income and as much as the harder you work, hopefully the more profits you make. But you can't pick and choose what that figure will be. So you have no control over the amounts that go into your income tax computation. If you have that employment income, you have that trading income, you have that property income, you have that interest income, you have that dividend income, then using the relevant bases of assessment, usually of course a received basis, but of course with trading income, our current year basis needs to be applied there. Those figures will be assessed in relation to the tax year. You can't say, well, that employment income, you can't say to your employer, um, look, you, my annual salary is uh, £50,000. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to pay me 40000 of that this year and that on the 10000 next year. Or I've got annual salary of 40000 each year. I tell you what, employer, you give me 10000 of next year's salary this year. I have 50 this year and 30 next year. No, you can't do that. That is not something that you control. But when it comes to capital gains tax, you decide when to dispose of an asset. Within reason, you decide when to dispose of an asset. And that therefore puts the power of planning rather more into your hands to take best advantage in terms of the timing of those disposals. So with the example I just gave to you there, we suggested that within the tax year, the taxpayer had made two disposals, gain £10,000 and a loss of £8,000. 
sustaining, crystallising that loss of 8000 in this tax year has saved not a penny in taxation. So what might we have suggested to our taxpayer prior to the disposals being made? It may well be that if we wanted to sell the asset that gave rise to the gain, we sell that one this year, but wait with the other one. Now, we have to also here think about the commerciality, the investment decision that we're taking. But the idea would be, if we're going to incur a loss of 8,000, and it will either be 8,000 crystallised this tax year, or we delay the disposal till the next tax year, and then have that loss of £8,000, then that delay would seem like a good idea. The reason being, if we leave in this tax year gains of £10,000 covered by AEA, no CGT. We then go to next tax year and we crystallise the loss. Now, you're thinking, how does that give you any advantage? Let's just remind ourselves about what would happen if in a tax year you had net losses. In my example, what would simply be a loss of £8,000. Right. If there are insufficient gains to set off against the capital losses in the tax year they arise, then the unrelieved capital losses will be carried forward. The unrelieved capital losses will be carried forward. The AEA is then deducted from any net chargeable gains of the tax year. If the AEA is larger than the chargeable gains, the remaining AEA is lost. Yeah, an AEA exists for each tax year. Use it or lose it. You therefore have the power to determine when disposals will take place, when you will crystallise gains, if there are gains to be made, when you will crystallise losses. And each and every year, you and us will discover shortly your spouse or civil partner has exactly the same decisions to make and each of you has each year an AEA, a level of tax-free gains, currently as we know for the 1920 tax year anyway, a figure of £12,000. Use it or lose it. It makes sense, therefore, to try to use it wherever possible to avoid gains that would otherwise have been taxable, if not this year, then in another year. The capital losses that are brought forward are then deducted after the AEA and therefore will not waste the AEA. Any capital losses brought forward that are unused continue to be carried forward. We don't ever waste losses brought forward. A loss brought forward is deducted from the gains, net gains of that future year after the AEA of that future tax year has already been deducted. So it's only if you are left with what would otherwise be taxable gains that you bring in your loss brought forward. And you only have to use the amount of that loss brought forward to bring those gains, taxable gains, down to zero there. What is unused this year or that year or any other year continues to be carried forward. So the losses brought forward are way more flexible in their use than a current year loss where well, you have no choice. It must be netted off against the other gains of the year. So let's therefore just uh, witness that situation in a little example here. So if we had the situation where in year one, a taxpayer had made gains of £10,000. Now we've said if there was otherwise going to be a loss of 8,000, there would be no point in this particular tax year yielding that loss of eight. Whether the gain is 10 or the net gain is two, both figures are covered by the AEA. There'd be no CGT liability to pay. The use of the loss would have saved no tax. So what do we do? We delay until the next tax year the loss we said of £8,000. 
Now, by crystallizing that loss in that second year, we have given ourselves the ability to use that loss in the future. Now, of course, what there might have been, there might have been gains in that second year. Gains of, ooh, £20,000, which then less 8000 would bring you down to 12000 Sufficient just to cover your AEA. So you wouldn't be wasting any AEA, you wouldn't be wasting any loss there. That would be sensible. But what we're suggesting here is that there aren't any other gains. Not yet, anyway. But this is still a good idea, because that second year loss would now be carried forward. And we've just said how then for the future, we'll go forward to year three, how any brought forward loss would then be used. So what happens in this third tax year? This time there are two disposals that occur within the year. One creates again gains of £17,000 and the other of course a loss of £2,000. Now remember the process. What must we do to begin with with those figures? You have no choice, you must net them out. So we net out the gains and loss, 17 less 2, will give us the net chargeable gains for the year of £15,000. And what then do we deduct from that 15000 We deduct to begin with the AEA of that year 3. That would be, let's assume that the 12000 runs throughout all of these examples, so we deduct £12,000. We'd have here a net of 15000 and if we've got an AEA, as we said, of 12000 that would leave £3,000 of what would otherwise be taxable gains, were it not for the fact that we've got this now loss of 8000 that was carried forward at the end of year two, that is brought forward into year three. So what's going to happen now, therefore? Well, hopefully you'd be able to work out there for yourself that if the net gains of the year, let's just follow it down, we know it to be 15,000. The net gains are 15,000. The AEA for the year is 12,000 leaving therefore what would have been £3,000 worth of taxable gains, but they won't be taxable because we have a loss brought forward. Now, how much of the loss brought forward did we have? We had £8,000 and we are now using, well, look, the gains at 3000 are less than that, we will use £3,000 to bring us to nil taxable gains. What happens to the other 5000 Well, the loss brought forward of 8000 we've only used 3000 sufficient to bring down those net gains to zero taxable gains. Therefore, we'd still have losses to carry forward of £5,000, that being £8,000 minus £3,000 we brought forward, eight we've used, three, there is a loss of £5,000 to carry forward. So in that way, we've been able to properly better utilise that loss now and also there for the future, rather than just wasting it if it had all been sustained back in year one, we'd have had 10 minus 8,000 would equal 2,000 pounds. And that, of course, wouldn't have saved us a penny. So you don't want to use the loss there. So you crystallized it in glorious isolation. Oh, isolation. Some of us are going through that at the moment. Uh, in glorious isolation there in terms of the second year. But that then means that as a loss being carried forward, 
it's far more flexible. You won't ever waste that loss as it's carried forward into the future. You would only put that against the net gains of the year after deduction of that year's own AEA, which means only gains that would otherwise have been taxable are now to be relieved by that brought forward loss. And what you don't use this year, you carry forward to the next year, to the next year, until such time as there are gains that it will be able to absorb. So there, therefore, we've got a little bit of planning as regards the timing of disposals. It might not, of course, just be that we had a gain already less than the AEA and a loss that was less than the gain, but therefore we didn't want to put the loss against a gain that wasn't going to have any tax paid on it. So we split that out to the next year. Of course, what you could have had is two gains. We've got a gain of £10,000. We've got another gain of £11,000. In which case, therefore, if we have both of those gains in this tax year, clearly 10,000, let's say 11,000, would take you to 21. You've got a 12,000 AEA, you end up with a taxable gain. Now, it may well be that that's still the best course of action. But if you were not going to have any other gains in the next tax year, if it was feasible, if you were able to do this, there was no good reason investment wise to not do this. You could delay the disposal of one of those assets. Crystallise a gain this year of 10 or 11,000. Crystallise a gain next year of either 10 or 11. Both of those individual numbers, 10,000 and 11,000, are less than the year's respective AEA. So we don't bundle all our gains up into one tax year, exceed that year's AEA, and end up paying tax on the balance of taxable gain. Let's make sure that each year, to the extent that we're able to, and it makes sense from an investment decision point of view, let us yield gains, <coughs> pardon me, sufficient to use up each year's AEA, making more gains year on year that are exempted from tax because we're using the AEA. You wouldn't want two gains exceeding 12,000 AEA in one year and nothing in the next year. If there was no investment problem with keeping one of those assets until the following 6th of April, the start of the next tax year, then do so and yield that gain in that year and utilise that year's AEA. Remember, AEAs, use it or lose it there. Same as the personal allowance. But unlike the personal allowance that goes against income, income that you didn't have control over, you do have control over the decision as to when to sell. Use that wisely so as to get the best use out of losses and to minimise the amount of capital gains tax that will be paid on any taxable gains. OK, time to look at example seven, therefore, where we are required to calculate the taxable gains for Fiona and Jane for both the 1920 and the 2021 tax years and the amount of any losses carried forward at the end of 2021. OK, firstly, Fiona. In 1920, what must we always do for any tax year for any individual we must firstly net out the gains and losses of that year. So what do we have? Fiona has gains of 15,000 and capital losses of 10,000, meaning therefore that she's made some net gains of £5,000. Those net gains of 5,000 would then be subject to the deduction of the AEA. Now, a fact that, as you know, in 1920, the AEA was 12,000 and it's now 12,300 in 2021 is somewhat irrelevant. 
because where we've got gains of only £5,000, it's more than covered by the AEA. So that brings you down, of course, to zero to nil taxable gains. Remember, any AEA that is unused for any tax year, that will be wasted. So in the tax year 1920, net out the gains and losses of the year. Those net gains here, 5,000, they do not exceed the AEA of the tax year. So there are no taxable gains and some uh, unused AEA arises and it stays that way, unused. It is wasted. On we go, therefore, to 2021. Ah, things are looking better here. We've got capital gains of 17,000 for the owner, and then we've got £4,200 worth of losses. So if we take one from the other there, well, 4 from 17 would be 30, another 200 come away is £12,800 of net gains. 12,800 net gains for the year. First exercise done. Well, in a bigger question, of course, you may have had to have computed any individual gains and losses. If this were part of a section B question here, then you'd have had exercises to compute the gains and or losses, here both gains and losses, put them together. We've done that and established that for 1920, we are talking about £5,000 worth of net gain. Uh, that, therefore, is more than covered, as we've said, by the AEA. There is nothing taxable. In 2021, here it's more likely that you'd have to do the calculations of the gains and losses. But this time we've got net gains of 12800 So with net gains of 12800 there for Fiona, we have an AEA for our tax year 2021. Of oops, let's uh, get the right way round. Twelve thousand three hundred pounds. Take it away, and therefore she's going to have taxable gains of five hundred. To be able then to tax those taxable gains, though there's not very much of them as you can see there, just five hundred pounds. You would need to know as well. You should know by now from the income tax computation for Fiona. For the 2021 tax year, you need to know the level of taxable income. You also need to know if it would be relevant there, what that basic rate, rate threshold may be, and whether that has been extended due to certain payments. Those certain payments, of course, being personal pension contributions paid and or any gift aid payments there. And there, if you're in the basic rate band, then, of course, we're talking about a 10% tax rate in relation to these gains, assuming that, again, they're just other assets. There is no residential property. There are no assets that rank for either business asset disposal relief or investors relief. More of those reliefs, of course, in Chapter 14. On, therefore, to uh, Jane now. A bit more interesting back in 1920 because she ends up with net losses of the year of 3,000. Now, when you, as you must, net out the gains and losses of the year, any net loss would then be carried forward for use against future gains. In the next tax year for Jane, in 2021, we have those gains. We have £13,000 of net gains. Again, remember, you must net out the gains and losses of the year. But what comes next as a deduction? The next deduction is, of course, your AEA, which for our 2021 tax year is 12,300. And that, therefore, leaves 700 pounds, leaves 700 pounds here in terms of what would be taxable gains were it not for the fact that Look at what we had carried forward at the end of the preceding tax year, brought forward into this tax year. We've netted out the gains and losses of the year. We've taken away the AEA. We have a figure that would have been a taxable gain of 700, but we've now got, and this is where they come in, the deduction of losses brought forward. Well, clearly, 3,000 is more than sufficient to cover the mere £700 worth of gains there that would have been taxable. So those gains come down from 700 to zero 
and it means we've used 700 out of 3,000. So we were asked, of course, to compute any losses to be carried forward at the end of 2021. This is only the case with Jane, and she will have, obviously, 3,000 less 700, 2,300 pounds worth of losses to carry forward. Remember that difference when you carry forward losses as compared to when you incur losses in the tax year. Very different treatment. Losses in the year, as we've seen, you have to net out against the gains of the year. And whatever that may be, as a net gain, whether inside or more than the AEA limit, it doesn't matter, you net them out. If there are more losses than gains, then you have a net loss and that may be carried forward for use in future tax years. So you must net out the gains and losses of the year. Where you have a loss brought forward, it is the last deduction to apply. Firstly, net out gains and losses of the year. Secondly, deduct the AEA. And if you're still looking at a taxable gain, or what would otherwise be a taxable gain, now you deduct your loss brought forward. In that way, we get the best use out of the AEA that, if unused, could not be carried forward. It would simply be wasted. And we get the best use out of the loss brought forward, because if that is not now all used, we had 3,000 brought forward, we use 700, then that we do get to carry forward to the next and to any other future tax year in which it may be used. OK, well, as ever, go back, check through what we've done through this particular session before we uh, then move on to the next part. Probably another couple of lectures to come here in relation to the completion of Chapter 12.